Shortly after the end of World War I, London was suffering from an epidemic of pneumonia, and British medical officer Frederick Griffith was conducting experiments trying to find a vaccine. His experiments centered around two strains of Streptococcus pneumonia bacteria, the smooth and the rough. One strain of cells secreted a kind of slimy shell around its cell wall, giving its colonies a smooth appearance. The other strain had no such shell, so its colonies appeared rough. Griffith found that when the smooth bacteria were injected into a mouse, the mouse would die. Then he tried injecting the mouse with rough bacteria. They proved to be harmless. He thought perhaps that it was the slimy shell that made the smooth cells deadly. To find out, he killed a group of smooth cells with heat and injected them, with slimy coating intact, into the mouse. The mouse lived, which meant that the smooth coating was not in itself enough to cause death. However, heat killed smooth cells and live rough cells were both injected into the mouse, and the mouse died. Even more surprising was that when Griffith examined the dead mice, he found live smooth cells. Somehow, a substance from the dead smooth cells had been absorbed by some rough bacteria and turned them into the deadly smooth strain. Griffith failed to produce a vaccine, but he had stumbled upon the principle of transformation, a discovery that led to the identification of DNA as the molecule of heredity and a property of bacteria that is now of central importance to molecular biology and medicine. In the 20 years after Griffith published the results of his experiment, other scientists added to and refined his work. In the 1940s, scientists would identify DNA as the mysterious substance that caused the rough cells to transform into smooth. This development opened the door to genetic engineering. Much of the current research in molecular biology involves transformation of Escherichia coli cells. The following experiment will demonstrate the transformation of E. coli cells with the PUC8 plasmid. In order for a cell to accept foreign DNA, it must first be in a state known as competency. A naturally competent bacterium will bind foreign DNA with proteins embedded in its cell wall. Then a nuclease will split the double helix and proteins will bring one strand inside the cell to either be recombined as a plasmid or inserted into the bacterium's chromosome. Most E. coli cells are not naturally competent, so for this experiment, they must be forced into competency. One way to do this is through electroporation, the application of an electric charge to weaken the cell membrane. Prepare two tubes of E. coli and add the PUC8 plasmid to one of them. Electroporate them both and place them on ice for about 10 minutes. Transfer the cells out of the electroporation tubes and place them in a 42 degree water bath for 90 seconds. Ice them again for one minute. Then, using a sterile pipette, add Luria broth to each tube and place them in a 37 degree water bath for 30 minutes. This will allow the cells to grow, repair their membranes, and express the genes of the newly acquired DNA. When the cells are ready, they need to be inoculated onto three separate auger plates. They all contain a chemical inducer, IPTG, and the colorless chemical substrate, XGAL, which will be affected by the presence of the PUC8 plasmid. One of the control plates and the DNA plate also contain ampicillin, an antibacterial agent. Transfer the solution from the control tube to both control plates. Using a fresh, sterile pipette, do the same with the DNA solution. Using aseptic techniques, spread the cells across the plates with an inoculating loop.
Cover the plates and allow the liquid to be absorbed. After approximately one hour, place the plates in an incubator for 15 to 20 hours at 37 degrees. The plates should be incubated upside down to prevent condensation from dripping onto the culture. Each plate should produce a different result. Control 1 was not exposed to the PUC8 plasmid. Its auger was infused with the inducer IPTG and the substrate XGAL, but in the absence of PUC8, they will have had no effect. After incubation, the competent cells should have freely reproduced and may look like a smeared layer or a lawn of white cells. Control 2 also lacked the PUC8 plasmid. Its auger was infused with IPTG and XGAL, and also the antibacterial agent ampicillin. The ampicillin should have killed all these cells, resulting in no growth. If any growth has occurred, it will have been from cells that are naturally resistant to ampicillin. They should be few and white. The DNA plate contains cells that were exposed to the PUC8 plasmid. A certain number of those cells should have been transformed and will express the absorbed genes. There will be two noticeable effects from this transformation. First, PUC8 makes E. coli cells resistant to ampicillin. All the non-transformed cells should have died during incubation, leaving only colonies of transformed cells. Second, the PUC8 plasmid produces an enzyme that breaks down XGAL, leaving a blue product and consequently coloring the cells blue. We now know that in Frederick Griffith's famous experiment, the mysterious material that turned the rough cells smooth was plasmid DNA, found in dead smooth bacteria. This plasmid was responsible for the creation of the slimy layer around the cell walls resulting in smooth colonies. Once transferred to the harmless rough cells, the plasmid turned them deadly as well. Unfortunately, Griffith died in an air raid in London in World War II. He didn't get to see the final explanation for his experiment nor how that explanation would lead to the identification of DNA as the molecule of heredity. He died unaware of his own great contribution to modern genetic science.